Welcome to our video, Japan and the World. The topic for this time is, Biden's emerging new Ukraine policy. Failed U.S. policy to date based on gross exaggeration of American firepower and misguided wishful thinking Russia would eventually back down. I would like to focus on the commentary in Asia Times by Stephen Bryan who served as staff director of the Near East Subcommittee of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and as a deputy undersecretary of defense for policy. The Biden administration wants the Ukraine war to continue at least until after U.S. presidential elections in November but there is a lurking danger that won't be possible. Especially if Russia mounts a really big offensive. For that reason, there is a new emerging plan, one that is not in writing but seen in politics. An example. When Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky decided to fire armed forces commander Valery Zeluzhny, U.S. Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs Victoria Nuland, who is directly responsible for U.S. and NATO Ukraine policy, rushed to Kiev. There are no photo ops with Newland and Zelensky. She briefed the press standing outside in front of a hastily assembled table with some microphones on it. Why did Newland run to Kiev? Almost certainly the White House told her to get herself over there immediately in case things went south in Kiev. There was apparently real worry that Zeluzhny might turn the army around and use it to go after Zelensky. So far, Zeluzhny has not made a move. He still can, of course. So one supposes that Newland was in Kiev to talk more to Zeluzhny than to Zelensky. There is no public record of any meeting but it would seem that her job was to calm Zeluzhny down and offer him incentives to behave. Washington is saying nothing officially about the changing of the military guard in Kiev. The White House says it is an internal Ukrainian issue, not one Washington would have anything to say about. Certainly, this is pure nonsense. Washington has been manipulating Ukraine's internal politics since before 2014, and Newland was the spark plug to get what Washington wanted. Nor was there any surprise about cashiering Zeluzhny. Someone has to take the blame for the failure of Kiev's so-called counteroffensive and the waste of billions of dollars in U.S. equipment and supplies. It also isn't a surprise that things are getting worse now, as Ukraine will soon face the loss of Avdivka and the Russian army, newly refurbished, will push toward the Dnieper River, aiming at Kiev. As has been noted now ad nauseum, Kiev's manpower situation is dire and its lack of weapons means it is limited in what it can hope to do. But the real kicker is that Kiev's mounting casualties, more than 1,000 per week, are hitting hard on the public perception that the war has gone wrong. To pull men and women into the army Kiev resorts to rough, unpopular measures, including threats and intimidation. Going to the front untrained is seen more and more as a certain death sentence, which it is. Zelensky won't negotiate with Russia because Washington is opposed to any negotiation, seeing it as a potential defeat for NATO. The result would be unnerving NATO and truncating Washington's leadership of the alliance. Politically, Zelensky is more and more aligned with Kraken and other military formations who are extremely anti-Russian and anti a lot of other things. The Russians regard them as fascists and Nazis. But how can Kiev hold on if Russia actually mounts a major new military action in Ukraine? An offensive is likely mostly because Putin needs one to cement his next term as president. Elections are scheduled for March 17, and Putin's re-election is likely because he has suppressed any real opposition. But even so, Putin needs a boost from the Russian public and a celebratory election would count for a lot. This puts Kiev in a terrible bind. Once there is a real Russian breakthrough across the current line of contact, sending Ukrainian forces reeling backward, it will be nearly impossible for the Zelensky government to survive in Kiev. Under such circumstances, there are already indications of planning to move the Ukrainian government westward, probably to Lviv, 
LVOV, which is near the Polish border. The Poles are already saying they might use their nearby air defenses to protect Lviv. Why would they say this? The reason is that they are preparing a plan to hold off the Russians by use of Polish Patriot and other air defenses, and even to send Polish brigades reinforced by other NATO assets. The British are already preparing public opinion and openly talking about sending their special forces to Ukraine's rescue. Anyone who looks at a map must realize that the only way NATO can invade or support a Zelensky government is if it is done close to the border with Poland. That's far enough away from Russian missiles that it will be difficult for Russia to deal with that area. Unless of course there is either a de facto or de jure breakup of Ukraine in which the western part stays somewhat independent while the rest is subject to whatever arrangements the Russians decide to impose. Nothing will happen if the Russians stay with the plotting, slow grind up of Ukraine's army. But, as noted above, the Ukraine war is reaching an inflection point for both military and political reasons. Shifting the Ukraine government to Lviv and gaining support from Poland and the UK, no others are likely to contribute anything, would buy time for Biden. Although the end result either will be a war in part of Europe, Poland, the Baltic states, or a stalemate that Russia and NATO accept. Biden gets off the hook for the time being if this scenario plays out but even in the medium term it is a strategic disaster. Biden of course, is mindful he does not need and cannot survive another Afghanistan-like disaster. British enthusiasm for war owes to pressure from Washington. It is well to remember that the British military is an unholy, underfunded and undermanned mess. The British forces lack materials, lift and cover to do much of anything. And it is foolish to think the Russians won't retaliate, that leaves the impression that British enthusiasm for war is simply fake news, intended to scare the Russians somehow. Most of Washington's Ukraine policy has been based on the exaggeration of the value of American weapons and coordination capabilities. And on wishful thinking that Russia would back out of the conflict. Any look at Russian history, dating back to Napoleon, should have suggested that Russia wasn't going to back down. Moreover, taking into account British bombast, one is reminded of the outcome of the charge of the Light Brigade. Will we see another balaclava in Ukraine? Newland has created a disaster with the full backing of the Biden-Obama team. As, so far, there is no counterweight in the United States or among the NATO states, the disaster will roll on. Washington will continue to risk a war in Europe, even a nuclear war, to try and salvage the disaster of its own making. Washington and Newland are effectively trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. That's all. Biden's emerging new Ukraine policy, by Stephen Bryan, who served as staff director of the Near East Subcommittee of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and as a deputy undersecretary of defense for policy.